Good afternoon. I welcome everyone who is working in the studio with us today and those who have joined us online. Yesterday we examined some very important muscles of the neck. With the specific attention for one of the most important muscles for the artist, which is the sternocleidomastoid muscle. We examined its structure thanks to one of the diagrams in one position. And today we are going to examine the same muscle and also other neck muscles from the different views. And that corresponds with the wishes uh, that we received from you yesterday. In order to imagine better how the sternocleidomastoid muscle is structured and some other muscles of the neck, we have to study these muscles from the different positions and from the different views. I propose to complete three or four diagrams, and three of them are the main ones. This is the image of the head, neck, and the shoulder girdle in the profile view. Then the same uh, parts uh, from the frontal position. And the same three main parts from the behind. So we are going to start from the profile view. On my picture, you can find the outlines of the facial part of the skull. Uh, this is the frontal nasal knot, nasal cavity, then the basis of the mandible, angle of the mandible, and the uh, back side of the branch of the mandible. Uh, additionally, I depicted the temporal line, the gamatic arch, please keep in mind that the zygomatic arch here is horizontally located. I also outlined the eye socket in the profile and also showed the profile of the zygomatic bone. And completed the image by one of the cartilages of the ear, which is the tragus. Also here we have the outline of the occipital bone. And also we can add the cartilages to our diagram. Those are the cartilage of the nose. Then the cartilages of the ear. And also upper and lower eyelids. In the bottom part of the diagram we have the hyoid bone. And below the hyoid bone there is thyroid cartilage which protrudes a bit. These elements of the skull are enough in order to connect them to the muscles of the neck. Now let's examine the main elements of the shoulder girdle. Firstly, it's sternum. 
Uh, I'm also emphasizing the sternal angle here. I remind you that it lies in between of two parts of sternum. And these two parts are called the manubrium and the body of sternum. Then two bones of the shoulder girdle, which is the clavicle and the scapula. In profile, we can see well the curves of the clavicle, and I remind you that there are two curves of the clavicle. And in order to emphasize these curves of the clavicle on your pictures, I recommend you to use the transversal hedge going like that. The outer edge of the clavicle gets connected to the acromion which is the branchial process of the scapula. I'm showing its thickness. Continuing to draw the scapula, I'm outlining the second process, which is directed in front. It's called carasoid process of the scapula. And this is an important process when we study the muscles of the chest and the muscles of the shoulders. A bit below the processes we have this notch where the head of the shoulder joint uh, is located. It covered with cartilage. And so together with the head of the shoulder bone, it creates the shoulder joint. These all bone elements we need in order to apply the muscle layer to our diagram. Uh, I think we have to start uh, depicting the muscles from the ones uh, that support the hyoid bone. So we'll start from the muscles that are above the hyoid bone. Uh, these muscles lift up the hyoid bone, for example, while swallowing. And among these muscles, we emphasize two of them. The first one is digastric. So, and here we have two bellies of this muscle, the frontal and the back one. And also the myelohyoid muscle. Among the muscles that are below the hyoid bone, so here we can outline the sternohyoid muscle. This muscle is very thin one, so it cannot really affect uh, the shape created by the larynx. And 
And after depicting the muscles that relate to the hyoid bone, now we can move to the most important one, and as we already know, it's sternocleidomastoid muscle. We know that it starts from the hyoid bone and the hyoid bone with a tendon leg. We know that it starts from the sternum with a tendon leg. I'm showing this tendon leg now. Которая преобразуется в мясистое брюшко. And then this tendon turns into the muscle. Это мясистое брюшко направляется к месту своего прикрепления. And then this muscle belly goes up to the point where it gets attached. А прикрепляется оно, как мы знаем, к сосцевидному отростку височной кости и немного к затылочной кости. And as we know, it gets attached to the mastoid process of the temporal bone and a little bit to the occipital bone. So now we depicted only one part of the sternocleidomastoid, which is the sternal part. And now we had add uh, the clavicular part of the same muscle. On the profile view, it looks the following way. In this, position, in this position, we also can clearly see the fossa that appears between the two parts of sternocleidomastoid. I remind you that this fossa is called minor supraclavicular. And I remind you that there is also a big triangular fossa above the clavicle. And it's built by the uh, back edge of the sternocleidomastoid. And the frontal edge of the trapezius, so this one. And the clavicle. A trapezius belongs to the muscles of the back. However, without this muscle, it's not possible to build up the neck. It's not possible to visualize, to imagine the shape of the neck and its overall construction. Trapezius starts from the occipital lines. In this area, it's very close to the sternocleidomastoid. However, on the bottom, in the clavicular area, it's a big gap between these two muscles, and that's how the big major uh, supraclavicular force appears. On my diagram, you can see only one part of trapezius, and this is the part that starts from the head, meaning the occipital area. And the fibers of this muscle get attached to the outer edge of the clavicle and partially to the acromion of scapula. Now we can move on to the next diagram, which is the frontal view. I allowed myself to not show the facial skull in this diagram in order to focus on the neck area. However, I outlined the parietal part. 
and also the zygomatic bones. The branches and the angles of the mandible, the chin, and the ears. In the frontal view on the neck of an adult, the hyoid bone can be quite prominent, which is located a bit below from the chin. But I'm emphasizing that it is only for adults. We can't see this bone on the child neck because the hyoid bone is located higher. Below the hyoid bone we have the larynx. Then the cartilage, which has the most significance for us, which is thyroid cartilage. A bit below we have thyroid glands, which uh, get attached to the thyroid cartilage. It consists of two parts. And between them, there are these connections. That's how the thyroid gland looks like. It is red colored, however, it's also covered with fascia, so uh, it's not well seen that it's red colored. The thin muscles I mentioned earlier cover both thyroid cartilage and the glands, so it smooths the shape of these elements. All muscles of the neck are paired muscles, so here you can see a slight line in the middle. So we examine the bone uh, elements of the head and neck now, which is mostly the mandible and the hyoid bone, and uh, then the cartilage, thyroid cartilage with the thyroid glands. Now let's look at the sternum from the frontal view. It's its upper edge, which has the notch. This notch is called the jugular notch. And on the left and right side from this one there are other notches for the claviculars. And exactly in these notches, the heads of clavicles uh, are puzzled in and they are covered with the cartilage. I remind you that these heads are protruding over the jugular notch a bit and I'm trying to emphasize it on all my diagrams. In this position, we also can see the curves of the clavicles well. Uh, and again, to emphasize these curves of the clavicles, we use the transversal hatch. The outer edges, as we know, get connected to the acromions. This 
And this is an important element for us now because we are going to depict the trapezius and trapezius partially get attached to the acromions. On my picture you also can find manubrium of sternum and part of its body. And also small uh, fragments of the first and second ribs. It's the cartilage parts. I remind you that the cartilage of the second rib lies almost horizontally. I always outline cartilage parts in blue color in order to be able to define them easily. As the next step, we can start depicting the sternocleidomastoid. As always, we start from depicting the sternal leg. So I drew these tendon legs from left and right sides. And on this uh, diagram, I'd like to explain the significance of the jugular notch. Jugular notch consists of the following elements. So the first one is the uh, notch of the sternum. The second one is the bottom of the jugular notch. It consists of the wind pipe covered with thin muscles. And on the neck of a real person, it looks like an almost flat plan. And of course, very important parts of the jugular notch are the um, sternal legs of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. They are normally very well visible underneath the skin. What you probably um, get convinced about while watching the neck of our model. The tendon parts of the muscles then go into the muscle parts. And, and afterwards, uh, right and left sternocleidomastoid muscle go up to the place where they get attached to the mastoid processes. However, we don't see this knot on the frontal view so well. That's because the angles of the mandible and the masseter muscle cover the view, so we don't see it. When drawing sternocleidomastoid muscle, you have to keep in mind to show that some parts of these muscles are closer to us than other parts. That's exactly why I return now to the profile view to show you the diagonal direction of the muscle. Uh, 
I'm emphasizing this fact now because many beginner artists show this massa like it's all on the vertical line and there are no differences and it's a big mistake. In order to show this muscle correctly, you have to work more on these uh, closer frontal parts of the muscle and define less the further areas and also use the transversal head chain. And then you uh, will be able to reflect the 3D environment and show this muscle correctly. Even on this uh, very simplified diagram, you can see how the volume and the dimensions appear when you use the transversal hatching like this. Between the sternocleidomastoid, uh, larynx and mandible, there is a um, triangular fossa. And when you're drawing the neck area, I ask you to keep attention not only to the protruding elements like muscles and cartilages, but also on the concaved ones. In our previous class, we paid more attention to the minor and major supraclavicular fossas. And today I want to pay your attention to the fossa which is in between the larynx and the sternocleidomastoid muscle. Um, it's called... Uh, it's called the carotid uh, fossa. Because inside uh, this fossa there is carotid. Do I pronounce carotid? Carotid? Hmm? The carotid artery is inside this fossa and that's why the fossa got this name. And then the second part of the sternocleidomastoid, which is weaker, as we, uh, we said yesterday. It starts from the clavicle. And it's located a bit lower than the sternal part of the same muscle. Despite the fact that on a real body this clavicular part is less visible than the sternal part of the muscle, I still recommend you to outline it. It shouldn't be exaggerated, but it should be outlined. Then here you can see the contour line of the trapezius. I remind you that the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius create this big fossa um, here. It's triangle shaped. It's called major supraclavicular Inside uh, this triangular fossa, uh, there are several muscles, but they don't have such a big uh, artistic significance. 
It's uh, splenius uh, services. One of the most important muscles that allow to turn head left and right. In anatomy, it's considered to be a muscle of the back, not a muscle of the neck, and that's why we didn't speak about it uh, in our classes. And also inside this triangular fossa, there is another muscle, muscle of the back. Uh, it's called levator scapulae. And finally, in the same triangle, you can see the muscle of the deepest layer. And I mentioned these muscles in one of the previous class. These are the scalene muscles. Uh, they are the res respiratory muscles by its function. Uh, sometimes also when turning the head you can see this uh, oblique muscle. Это очень длинная мышца, которая начинается от лопатки, а прикрепляется к подъязычной кости. Uh, it's a very long muscle that starts from the scapula and get attached to the hyoid bone. It's one of the muscles that strengthens the hyoid bone. It's called omohyoid muscle. Uh, and it prevents uh, the overpressure of the clavicle on the uh, vessels, articular vessels. We can, no, see, mm -hmm. we can see only inferior belly of this muscle, but not always and not for all people. I mentioned this muscle only because uh, sometimes students ask what is this muscle above the clavicle that has this oblique, um, oblique muscle. And the last view, the view from behind, uh, in this position you also can see a bit of sternocleidomastoid. So here you have the contour lines of the skull. The suture that connects left and right parietal bones. Then the, mm -hmm. Also the contour lines of the occipital bone, which get connected to other bones uh, with the lamboid suture. So this uh, part of occipital bone reminds of triangle. Also here is the occipital protuberance on the midline. And also the occipital lines that I remind you have arch shape. On the profile view, we also show these occipital lines, however, they were contracted, and here you can see them uh, frontally. And in order to understand from which position we are looking at the head, I also outlined the ears. 
вот по средней линии шеи сзади проходит сухожилие. Um, along the midline of the neck uh, there is a tendon. Это связка шеи, о которой я расскажу несколько позднее. Она важна для понимания. It's a ligament of the neck I told I'll tell you about later because it's an important one to understand the structure. От затылочной линии, а также от этой связки начинается трапециевидная мышца. And from the occipital lines and also this ligament, the trapezius starts. А именно та ее часть, которая связана с головой и плечевым поясом. And specifically its part which is connected to the head and shoulder girdle. Ее волокна следуют вниз. Its fibers go down. Для того, чтобы прикрепиться к наружному концу ключицы. To get attached to the outer edge of the clavicle. Мы это видели на нашем первом рисунке. We already saw it in our first diagram. А также к акромиону. And also to the acromion. Также к акромиону, который я обозначаю желтым мелом. Which I outline in yellow color. А сзади он выглядит как площадка. From behind it looks like a plane которая прикрепляется трапециевидная мышца и от которой начинается дельтоидная мышца. To which trapezius get attached and from which uh, deltoid starts. Поскольку я изобразил часть спины, я прокомментирую. As long as I depicted part of the back, I will make some comments. Прокомментирую эту часть рисунка. Посередине имеется сухожилие ромбовидной формы. So in the middle we have a tendon of rhomboid form. А в этом ромбе довольно отчетливо читается выступ, который соответствует седьмому шейному органу. And inside this rhomb we can see a protruding area which matches with the seventh cervical vertebra. На спине любого человека прочитывается этот ромб. You can find this ромб on the back of any person. Ну, у разных людей он воспринимается по-разному. У кого-то он заметен сильно, у кого-то он почти не заметен. However, it can be perceived differently because sometimes it's very visible, sometimes it's less visible, so it depends. Минута осталась. Это связано исключительно с развитием трапециевидной мышцы. And it's related solely to the development of the trapezius. The reason is that this figure uh, is a tendon, from which the second part of trapezius starts if we say that the one that starts from the occipital bone is the first one. We know that all muscles starts from the bones with the tendon parts. And the part of trapezius that we examine also starts with the tendon part. And this tendon has a triangular. Is triangular. So two triangles together creating this rhomboid area. And for this reason, the more uh, muscles of the back, or namely trapezius, is developed, the more visible this rhomboid area will be. And finally, we can show how sternocleidomastoid look on this in this view. So here we have the mastoid process. And now we can show the 
direction of the uh, sternocleidomastoids, which are connected to these processes. And, mm -hmm. and from this point, they go just to the place, uh, the point of their start, to the clavicle and to the sternum. So on these three diagrams, I've tried to show the structure, the shape uh, of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. However, if you have any questions, we can return to them after. Now let's examine a very important knot, which is connected to the anatomy of the neck from the behind. And for that, we will return to the profile view first. And on this um, diagram, I showed two curves of the spine. So the cervical lordosis and thoracic kyphosis. We have to um, emphasize that on the midline of the spine, when we look at it from behind, there go a number of processes that are called spinous processes. And to make uh, the spinal column stronger and more stable, these processes are connected with the ligament. It's a long ligament uh, that goes along all the protruding parts of the vertebras. And that are the spinous processes of particular vertebras. If to look at the spinous processes of vertebras from different compartments of the spine, we will see the following uh, picture. So now I'm drawing uh, the left profile of the spinal column. So on, at the um, top uh, there is a skull leaning on it. Then I divide the spine into four parts and give the names to all these parts. Cervical, thoracic, lumbar, and sacrococcyxical. So on this diagram you can see the two parts are directed in front and two departments on the opposite to behind. So these uh, departments are called lordosis and this one's called kyphosis. So, when we look at the spinous processes in the lumbar uh, spine, we will see that they are long and very protruding. There are five processes, and between them there are muscles. 
заморозки полностью отсутствуют в крестце и в копчике. There are no such processes in the sacral or coccyx. Они срастаются, образуя гребень. They merge together, creating a crest. И подобных мышц в крестце и копчике в отделе позвоночника, конечно, нет. And so there are no such muscles in the sacral uh, region as there are in the lumbar. В грудном отделе in the thoracic uh, compartment, the spinous processes are also long, however, they are directed down. And the number of these processes is the same as the number of the vertebras in this uh, compartment, so there are 12. Between them there are also muscles. And about the spinous processes in the cervical spine, uh, we already talked about them, so we know that the longest one is the seventh cervical vertebra. And all other processes are a bit shorter. And first cervical vertebra doesn't have such a process. On the top of all these processes, there goes the long ligament, which looks approximately like that. So it gets connected to all the protruding points. What I depicted now is the ligament. So this ligament goes up to the cervical uh, spine. And then now we will depict a couple of vertebras. So the first. So the first one has just a tubercle, then from second to the six vertebras they have quite short spinous processes and and the seventh has a very developed process. And the processes of similar lengths to the seventh cervical vertebra are in the thoracic spine. Now we will transfer the long ligament to this uh, diagram. And here we stop on the seventh cervical vertebra. So its main function is to connect all the vertebras between each other. And so how, uh, how does it behave in the cervical spine? It's either uh, go down to the level. Or it goes up to the occipital bone and get connected there. So two options, either it continues on the level of the vertebras or it goes up to the occipital bone and get attached there. Но в таком случае она должна образовать вот такую сухожильную пластинку. However, in this case, it will turn into such uh, tendon plug. Сразу отметим, что правильный второй вариант. Uh, I'll tell you from the beginning that the correct option is the second one. Это означает, что когда мы смотрим на шею человека сзади, it means that when we look uh, at the neck of a person from behind, we almost don't see the cervical vertebras. 
какую-то выступающую пластинку, которая особенно хорошо проявляет себя, когда человек наклоняет голову. However, we see some kind of a plaque, some kind of this protruding uh, line uh, that's especially visible when person tilt the head. And that's exactly the occipital ligament I told you about. And I am focusing on it now because from this ligament trapezius also starts. And because this muscle is a very developed one, its contralines go further, the ligament, which is already in this concave part. So when we look at the back, uh, at the neck, from behind we can see this line in between of two parts of the muscle, of the trapezius. So when you draw a person from behind, you draw the head and neck, please keep in mind and try to reflect properly the shape of trapezius and this groove between the two parts of muscle. And then on the level of the seventh cervical vertebra, this, ten, this ligament goes into the rhomboid part. And those are very important elements of the construction, so I'm paying your attention to them now. And to explain it even better, I'll allow myself to draw another diagram. Um, I will draw one cervical vertebra, and let's say it's the sixth cervical vertebra. So I will draw it from the top. It looks like that. And from the spinous uh, process, of course, uh, there is a ligament going across it. And and this ligament is get surrounded by the fascia, uh, fascia которая окутывает шею, uh -huh, which uh, surrounds the muscles of the neck on behind. And the thing is that I'm always showing muscles in red or pink color on my diagrams. Although all muscles are covered with the protective membrane, which has white color. And these membranes are called fascia. And now I'll show you the muscles that start not only from the bones but also from the uh, occipital ligament. These muscles are located in several layers. And the most superficial layer that's right underneath the skin is trapezius. 
комментарий, который я считаю необходим для того, чтобы вы могли проанализировать и правильно рисовать шею сзади. So I find this information extremely important for you to analyze and to transfer this knowledge on your drawings when you draw an act from behind. So now we've studied the neck from different positions. And to sum up all the knowledge that we received about the neck, we can uh, turn into one more, turn to one more <laughs> diagram. So head and neck will be shown in three quarters. Thank you, exactly, three quarters. <laughs> However, this diagram will be different from the one that we made yesterday. Because yesterday we showed the head turned to the left shoulder, and today we will show uh, these parts in three quarters, but with the head uh, directing straight. Directed straight. We will not show the whole head, we will show just the chin area. So the bottom edge of the mandible or the basis of the mandible. Angle of the mandible. Then slightly outlining uh, the right cheek. And of course the midline of the chin. Midline, midline of the chin continues on as the midline of the neck. Uh, but when you will depict uh, the head and neck in such position, please always show the gap between these two lines. This gap is defined by the fact that skin gets attached to the basis of the mandible, to the chin. And for this reason, when we look at the head from frontal position, we have two planes, first plane and second plane. And I reflected it in the diagram. When you depict the chin, always show its bottom plane, bottom surface of it. Very often, this area illuminated by the reflected light. Because the body uh, of a person in the chest area reflects the light up. And you can see it very well, uh, especially in the cases when the model wears uh, white color clothes. And to show the bottom surface of the chin, you can depict a double contour line. And then you can move to the midline of the neck. But for now, it's only the chin area of the neck. So it's the area that's above the hyoid bone. And hyoid bone is this very important constructive point that we told before. You have to point it out even in the case when hyoid bone is not visible at all. Uh, right after this, the midline goes into the profile of larynx. 
And this profile depends on the gender of the model. If it's a male model, then you always outline a big protruding part, which is the Adam's apple. Then the midline goes a bit behind, enters the jugular notch, and then change the direction in order to cover the frontal part of sternum. Then the midline goes onto the profile of sternum. And with that, you always have to point out the sternal angle. I remind you that it's the place of connection of the manubrium and body of the sternum. And right after, you can point out the jugular notch of the sternum. And then everything is quite easy if we remember the main uh, constructive elements. So, for instance, we remember that the heads of clavicles are always higher than the jugular notch. We remember that clavicles have two curves. So on the uh, diagram that I'm doing now, we look uh, at the person a bit from above. So the first curve, the inner curve, is very well visible. And the next advice I'd like to give to all artists who work with the shoulder girdle. Please try to avoid drawing clavicles one by one. First one clavicle and then uh, the right clavicle and then the left clavicle. Please try to find the general form that both clavicles create when we look at them. Um, artists always compare it uh, to the bow. Bow? Bow. And I will even allow myself to, to draw this full association to remember better. Hmm? So the arrow, its tip. Um. And I made this small picture just for you to remember the common shape of both clavicles. So in the position of three quarters, we always see one clavicle better than the other one. So uh, on my diagram, the length of the clavicle corresponds with the real length of the clavicle. It's the left clavicle. And the right clavicle contracts. Uh, at least we can say so about the most curving part. Uh, 
пользоваться штрихом, который идет в поперечном направлении. I can recommend you to use more uh, the transversal hatching in such places. И с помощью именно такого штриха можно uh, всегда увести дальние части формы на то расстояние, на которое нам нужно. And thanks to this uh, hatch, you can put the parts uh, that goes behind to the position where they're supposed to be. Besides, such hatching is close to the profile of the form. And we can even analyze this form. We will see that form of clavicles defined by the frontal plane. Here it is. Top plane. And also the bottom plane. And let's point out that on the skeleton we can see all these planes very well. Верхний край ключицы обрисован несколько лучше, а нижний как бы смягчен. But on the real body, the top plane is uh, very well defined, while the bottom one is softened. Это связано с двумя мышцами, которые располагаются под ключицей. And it's because of two muscles that are under the clavicle. Минимум двумя мышцами. Минимум, at least two muscles. Одна из этих мышц находится под ключицей и называется подключичная мышца. One of these muscles is under the clavicle, so it's called the infraclavicular muscle. Она начинается от хряща первого ребра. И прикрепляется к, ключ... к наружному концу ключицы снизу. It starts from the cartilage part of the first rib and get attached to the outer side of the clavicle. Ее функция состоит в укреплении грудины ключичного сустава. And it uh, strengthening the joint, the sternoclavicular joint. А значение для тех людей, которые рисуют, для художников, состоит в том, что она сильно смягчает нижний край. But what's important for artists is that it softens a lot the bottom plane of the clavicle by its presence. But of course, even more, this bottom edge of the clavicle is covered by the pectoralis major, which is right under the skin. And for this reason, my recommendation is to always define the upper plane, the upper side of the clavicle more than the bottom one. Basically, the upper edge, upper side of the clavicle is covered only with the skin. And this skin goes inside the major supraclavicular triangle, the fossa. And skin like soaking inside these fossas. Oh my god. Um. <laughs> and even the climatic conditions uh, affect this process. That's what's important to say about the bone structure. And right after we can move on to depicting the muscles and of course we start from sternocleidomastoid. We already know very well that it starts nearby the sternoclavicular joint. And with confidence, we depict its tendon parts. After a large <laughs> rate analytical work uh, that we did, it shouldn't be of any problems. Mm -hmm. So we have to point to make to put all these points almost automatically already, starting from the jugular notch. So then we show the sternal 
Uh, muscle belly of this muscle. And we remember that this muscle goes around the cylinder of the neck. And we remember that some parts of these muscles are closer to us than the others. And so we solve uh, this issue with the constructive hatching and by softening the part that's behind. And so the constructive hatch can define the profile of the sternocleidomastoid in absolutely the same way as we did it with the clavicle before. So for this reason, I always recommend when drawing any form to look at the profile of this form. Profile will always show you the orientation of the form and which hatching you have to use in this case. Then we outline the thyroid cartilage. And of course, we use not just the constructive lines, but also shed, shadow and light, light and shadowing. Obviously, I'm not using light and shadow on my diagrams, but any academic drawing uh, includes this part. My next advice to you is to always look after the direction of the profile of the sternocleidomastoid that goes further. In such cases, we always have to imagine that the muscle that's further from us, in this case, this is the right sternocleidomastoid, will eventually reach the mastoid process of the temporal bone on the right side. And what you have to show is the precise turn of this muscle. You're not obliged to build everything through the facial area, but the turn of the muscle. And of course, when this line will reach some elements that are on the first plane, it should be made in a softer way. It will be very correct. Uh, and after everything is very easy, we outline the clavicular parts of this muscle on the left and right sides. I will not repeat once again about these triangular fossas because we talked enough about them already. Then you look at the connection of two muscles of the sternocleidomastoid and trapezius. So in this position that I depicted, the sternocleidomastoid will be on the first plane, while trapezius on the second. Always show trapezius from two sides, on the right and on the left. Don't draw them separately, it's wrong. 
очень важная задача показать, что трапециевидная мышца объемная и в то же время показать, что какие-то ее части находятся совсем близко от нас, а какие-то уходят далеко. And then we have to show that firstly trapezius has some volume and secondly that some parts of this muscle are closer to us than other parts. И вот здесь снова на помощь нам, при, нам приходит штрих, который идет в поперечном направлении. And here again the transversal hatching will help us. Который можно назвать профильным штрихом. Which is the profile hatching. Пользуясь им одновременно с двух сторон, справа и слева. And so you apply it on both sides, on the right and on the left. А для того, чтобы это стало еще понятнее, мы можем провести некую условную линию, которая как бы рассечет все формы, которые мы изобразили. And to explain it a little bit better, we can make such a relative line that will cross uh, all the parts that we depicted. Я немножко утрирую эту линию. Я изображаю так, как если бы я смотрел uh, на этот профиль несколько снизу. Uh, I will exaggerate a bit this line, like we are looking at this profile from the below position. Сначала, конечно, мы описываем выпуск стропецевидной мышцы. So, firstly, of course, the protruding part of the trapezius. Потом наш штрих попадает в яму, это большой треугольник. Then our line goes into the fossa, which is the major triangular fossa. Потом мы описываем выпуклость правой груди на ключах на сосцевидной мышцы. Then we show uh, the protruding part of the sternocleidomastoid after of the thyroid cartilage of the larynx then protuberance of the left sternocleidomastoid then we show that the clavicular part of this muscle is lower than its sternal part. Then our hatch enters the fossa already on the left side of the neck. And finishes on the trapezius muscle. It's very good if, if this profile is connected to the contour line that goes transversely. Then the shape becomes even more evident. Когда вы моделируете подбородочную область шеи, я советую использовать штрих, который направлен в таком направлении. Он соответствует контуру подбородка. So, and two more moments. The first one is that when you are working with this uh, bottom chin area, I recommend you to use such a hatch, which goes along uh, this area, according to it. Пожалуйста, не забывайте о сонной ямке. Вот она. Uh, please don't forget about the carotid fossa. And also don't forget that in the area of the angle of mandible there can be a protuberance, an eminent area, uh, which is the gland. The gland that uh, produces the saliva.